I absolutely know that you were so excited for the gayest Star Wars ever. Let's get into it. Now, this was supposed to be my episode two review, which it still will be about the Acolyte, the new Star Wars show. But I came across, I mean, I'm not the only one who came across the clip. There are plenty of people who've reacted to this clip. But I went to the source. I didn't copy it from somebody else. So we're going to look directly from an interview from The Wrap. So we're going to check that out. And we're going to talk a little bit about it. Because, I mean, I'm not going to go into incredible amount of depth about episode two. I'm going to review a couple things, look at an article or so. Um... But what I have heard, and this comes from Chris Gore, is that episode three is what changes everything and makes everything absolutely terrible or absolutely great, depending on who you're talking to. I don't think it's anybody's great. Even this article, which I'll show you from The Vulture, that was really, really stoked for this, has kind of turned on the show. So let's take a look at this first. We're going to take a gander. Let me see if I can find it. It is. Yes, we're going to react to it directly because I was like, let's look at the clip itself. I don't want to look at nothing. So let's take a look. This is so for those of you who don't know, this is an interview uh, between uh, some dude and uh, what's her headland? Amanda Headland. I don't remember what. She's the writer, direct, she's she's the the Harvey Weinstein's personal assistant. Let's just leave it at that. I'm something Headland. We'll find out her name later. And the star of the show who plays two roles. She plays t- a, sweat of t- a set of twins. I remember back in the day when twins were like the double mint twin. I think that's a thing. Bubblegum twins? I don't know. <laughs> Let's check out the clip. This is arguably the gayest Star Wars, I think, by a considerable <laughs> margin. This is going to be a talking point. Some is nerds, it going to be a talking point? I'm sure so. Because nerds ins- are gay. Well, yeah. not, well, some nerds are very threatened by gay. Nerds are gay? <laughs> okay. I mean, I guess. Well, that's yeah. true. But yeah. in my world, nerds are gay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> People have told me that. She's non-binary, by the way. The girl who's absolutely dressed like a woman trying to be attractive, putting on makeup, wearing attractive outfits, she, you know, like having this, like showing all the skin, makeup, hair done. She got her hair did, but she's non-binary. Just, uh, you know. <laughs> People have told me that it's the gayest Star Wars, and I frankly... You're offended? Into it. it. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me, with a straight face, that C-3PO is straight. They're a couple. That's what I think. I mean, I don't I don't even know what's going on here. I think it's canon that R2-D2 is, is a lesbian. Oh, Ooh. interesting. Yeah. Ask Filoni. <laughs> Ask Filoni. Can you imagine? <laughs> Hey, okay, don't get me wrong. I know they're kidding, and that's all said in jest. Um, But apparently they have a response to this, the showrunner and lead actress. I, I don't know if they're just reacting. This is from Comic Book News. No, Comic Book Movie. I'm sorry. So it's Leslie, spelled weird. Leslie Headland and Amandla, also spelled weird. Stenberg, very Jewish of her to have an Amanda Stenberg, okay? Hanging out with Harvey Weinstein, sharing their belief that R2-D2 is a lesbian. I mean, they're droids, so I think they identify as beep bop boop, or maybe just as robots, or like, they don't breed, so I don't really know why they would have any sort of identity to them very strange to me none of this makes any sense some people saw the first four episodes and they're saying star wars like you've never seen it before the accolade soars thanks to its impressive cast disagree compelling setting also disagree i don't think i made this point in my in my last review i I just want to point this out i have been to star wars land which you may know as galaxy's edge in orlando I swear they filmed on on location in Galaxy's Edge. Now, that's a double-edged sword because 
Maybe I said this because you could still see the bathrooms and the exit signs and the fire. Like there are things that pull you out of the immersion. I absolutely 100% love Star Wars Land. Just call it Star Wars Land. Don't call it Star Wars Presents Galaxy's Edge. No. I, I love it. I think it's fantastic. But at the same time, it sure seems like the show is filmed there, which is not the greatest thing in the world. Maybe there are people holding Dune popcorn tins. I don't know. Possibly. But uh, they're like, it keeps you... Co- the mystery will keep you coming back. You mean the mystery that's already been solved where it's not the twin? Because the, there's twins that they said in the first episode. Now we just hope to have to hope the series sticks the landing. I I disagree. Okay, so let's let's talk specifically about the second episode. Don't you know that you're toxic? So of course, because it's a a toxic white male Jedi. All right, this I think is ridiculous. They say in interviews, Leslie Headland has ref- has ref- referenced Akira Kurosawa. She's never watched a Akira, Kur- Akira Kurosawa movie ever, and uh, Kill Bill as her influences. Uh huh. Along with Frozen. Now maybe that I can make more sense. That that makes sense to me. That Frozen is your inspiration for this. Um. I just don't. It, it's funny because uh, this 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 article is from Vulture. This writer is Noel Murray. Noel Murray wrote a book, or not wrote, read a book by Umberto Eco in 1980, the a novel, The Name of the Rose. And there's an 86 film adaptation. I know nothing about this, but he's like, this seems suspiciously similar to that. That's how basic this plot is. It's just so basic. This is basic, bitch. So I just don't really get it. It's funny because I I think I saw Critical Drinker review the first episode. and He's like, women in Star Wars can get run through with a lightsaber and not die. But if you throw a tiny little little throwing star at them, they'll die. And that's because we're talking about in the first episode, there's a Jedi Master who who dies immediately. You know, uh, Trinity from 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 the Matrix. You know, she just she just like dies for she's in it. They didn't want to pay her too much money. She costs Carrie M. Moss ca- costs too much money. So the episode begins. On the planet Olega, where they're hunting another Jedi on May's kill list. She's got four on her kill list. They figured it out. Well, apparently, she has to pay some little girl to uh, let her into the, the the place where the Jedi Master is 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 uh, is meditating, right? And she disables the droid. From then on out, there's no security. She could just walk in and out as she pleases. She could just like go through this roof thing. And if she could just go through the roof thing, why'd she bother disabling the droid? I, I don't understand. I also was under the impression that Jedi could like... Ha- they have powers, right? They're using all these force powers. like, But they can't detect some chick who's... Like they could at least say like, Oh, she's cloaked in the dark side and she can't be... Nope. They just they're like, nah, nobody. Why even bother having Jedi guards if they're not going to sense anybody? Just hire more droids. So uh, May shows up at a apothecary shop and talks to this weird dude who whips up a powerful poison from her home planet. And, uh, you know, long story short is she eventually gets him to wake up after the most ridiculous choreography ever of her trying to break his Jedi shield and then he's just like, yeah, bro, I'll just drink the poison and kill myself. And then, of course, it's so stupid. The twin go is is like lurking around. And they're supposed to walk, they're supposed to walk directly to the Master Jedi because they know she's gonna try to kill the Master Jedi. Somehow, the girl who's never been in this building before, they're literally being escorted to where the Master Jedi is meditating. Yet she beats them there. So that then when they walk in, 
they're like, oh my gosh, what did you do? You were holding the poison that killed him. And she goes, it wasn't me, I swear. And then the other Jedi, there's another Jedi dude who walks in and was like, I was tailing her. She did not do this. And it's like, there was zero point to that conversation because you guys were being escorted to Master Jedi. You should have walked straight to him. How the girl who's never been on this planet before ever magically wandered her way in to be where the Master Jedi is first does not make any sense. Terrible, lazy writing. It's just horrible right and that's what and even even this this writer who's like oh i really liked the first episode it was great right because we still don't exactly happen between may and these jedi but i predict predict a full flashback episode before this season is over because surely you don't hire carry on and moss for three minutes of screen time and dean charles chapman for just a few minutes of screen time each why would we do that? And there's a dumb Wookiee. The pacing issues that kept Acolyte's first episode for being a four-star winner haven't improved much in episode two. Granted, there's always been a little bit of stiffness in Star Wars. This, this just sucks. It's just not good. It's not good. There's, there's, the stiffness in, in Star Wars you're talking about comes from the prequels, which are also not good. So I guess they're just like, yeah, half of Star Wars sucks, so we might as well be in the half that sucks. All of it is just, it's garbage. Uh, Hedlin is still handling the action well. You mean when May is magically punching nothing that's there and falls down? Yeah, her force foo, which is incredibly stupid. All of this is dumb. I don't like it. There's really nothing. I, I, I don't really have anything else to say about it other than this was really stupid and apparently the gayest Star Wars ever. Now, I don't think we've crossed that the Rubicon yet because I don't know what they're talking about, but I'm assuming that we'll get there. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you think this is the gayest Star Wars ever? Is that okay? I mean, I don't care one way or the other. The thing that's going to matter is... Uh, Nobody's watching this, and nobody's watching Doctor Who. So I'm going to say that people are like, I don't remember there being the straightest Star Wars ever. Like, maybe there was. Maybe there wasn't. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, catch our full-length audio podcast on iTunes. It is free to you. You can also catch us live stream here Friday night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Good time had by all. I promise you'll have a good time. Come join my co-host and I as we discuss news, reviews, and all that other good stuff and more. We talk about upcoming upcoming things that you might be in or out on. And uh, join the channel. Like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. But I am on to the next one.